once again, we can't hear the bell when it rings. We need you guys to start like waving at us like this to sig signal that this, this service is technically started. Good morning. Welcome to worship as you're finding your seat. Um, I want to say welcome to those of you who are joining online. You may also find a seat and check in the link for the worship aid so that you can sing along uh, this morning. At the end of each pew, you'll find that there's uh, communication cards, attendance cards, whatever you want to call them. If you would like to take one of those for you and your family and sign. And then in the back of the church, there are offering plates. You can put them into the offering plate. Shall we pray together? <laughs> Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits that you have won for us, for all the pains and insults which you have borne for us. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we, un may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. So that sounded a little bit like God's bell. But before it was God's bell, it was Richard of Chichester who lived from 1197 to 1253. So things that are new are also old, and old things are new. Will you stand as you are able for the call to worship? And then we're going to sing praise to the Lord. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Why should we be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of our life. What have we to fear? Let us shout with joy to God. Let us sing and make music before our God. Good morning. Good morning. I need to sing this song, and I'm just really thankful I get to sing it with you. So. my shepherd I won't be wanting I won't be wanting He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams Death in dying 
shepherd's staff that comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemy. Sure. Which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold, behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my Among the scoffers, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life, and I know that it. interesting when I sing this one I there was a moment in my life where the lyric um, you're altogether lovely <laughs> um, suddenly hit me really hard it was like it was the first time I realized that I thought God was lovely which is a lovely word that I love to use um, <laughs> I just made an inside joke sorry guys <laughs> I made an inside joke. Um, But the truth is, like, there is something so beautiful about God, and lovely is a really great word. And (laughs) sorry. (laughs) 
It's true. My point is, I hope you all can get to a point where that it hits you as well. Maybe you're there. Maybe you've been there for a long time. But for me, something about God being loved is, I don't know, it gets me every time. So. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with. inside jokes are shared. So let me tell you a little story. It was December of 2019, and John and Anna Babe had first started worshiping here, and we were planning for the women's Christmas dessert, and Sarah and Anne were going to decorate a table, and Sarah decided to get wildly out of her comfort zone 
and invite somebody she did not know to sit at her table. So during a staff meeting, she picked up her phone and she dialed Anna Babe's number. Anna Babe wasn't able to answer. And Sarah left a three-minute message where she used the word lovely approximately 27 times. <laughs> Hi, Anna Babe. I was wondering if you would like to join us for a lovely evening at the lovely women's Christmas dessert where the tables are decorated in a very lovely manner. And, and, and like... You watch Sarah get caught in this loop where she couldn't stop talking and she couldn't stop saying the word lovely. And so now whenever we say the word lovely, it just causes everyone to laugh. And now you can be part of that joke too. And if you just want to harass her, you can come up to her and say, Sarah, I hope you're having a lovely day today. And um, it was such a great invitation that Anna Babe couldn't come. No. <laughs> she had to... <laughs> it was yeah. like able to watch somebody just like the wheels just come off and the car just keep bumping down the road it was pretty awesome so anyway that's the story behind yeah. that and thank you for being able to laugh at yourself and allowing us to join you in that in John? all fairness i wasn't prepared i wasn't preparing to do that inside joke i genuinely was saying like i remember the first time i I yeah. realized, like, oh, my gosh, I think Jesus is lovely. And I, like, broke down. Like, I couldn't sing the song. Yeah, and so but we But then could. I saw Sarah, and I thought, and that's such a lovely word. And it just started <laughs> coming out. And I was like, anyways. So what I think we could do right now is confess, yes? <laughs> it would be, it, you know what? I think it would be a lovely thing to do, don't you? I agree. So I'll pray the petitions, and we will sing the sung response that goes, you know, in your mercy, Lord, hear us. Heal us in your mercy, Lord. Let's pray together. God of all mercies, in Jesus Christ, you have given us a new and living hope. How we long to be soaked in your forgiving words of life that erase our sin, our fear, and our despair. In your mercy, Lord, hear us, heal us. In your mercy, Lord. Spirit of God, soften our hearts. Make them supple for your teaching. Show us the narrow way and guide us to the great shepherd's fold of protection that we might receive forgiveness and new life. In your mercy, Lord, hear us, heal us in your mercy. Jesus, we ask you to remember each one of us, grant us your pardon and peace, and call us into your beloved community for faithful living. In your mercy, Lord, hear us, heal us in your mercy. Amen. Friends, believe the good news that when we call out to the Lord seeking forgiveness, the Lord is faithful, the Lord is just, the Lord answers and forgives, and that brings us peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. It would be okay to turn to your neighbor and tell them the peace of Christ be with you. And while you're doing that, Sarah, if you want to come forward. Last Sunday, we had the opportunity of ordaining and installing uh, our new officers, and Sarah Templin wasn't able to be here for that. And so today, we have the opportunity to install her as a deacon in the life of our church. She served as a deacon previously, and so we get to ask her all those do you, will you questions. Why don't you come on up here? And um, we are excited to have you serve. And 
you're very brave to be here all by yourself. Last week there was safety in numbers, but Sarah, the members of Westminster believe you have been called by God through the voice of this congregation to serve Jesus in his church as a deacon again, and you've answered yes to God's call, and we want you to know that we're very grateful for your service, and so I want to ask you these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do and will. will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? I will. will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend? I'm not finished yet. <laughs> she's so eager. She's real. She's. Are you really eager? <laughs> Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. And will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will. Do we, the members of this church, accept Sarah as a deacon, believing she has been chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us to follow Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. And do we agree to encourage her, respect her decisions, and follow her as, and the other deacons as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, say we do. And so, Sarah, we are now going to lay hands and pray over you. So again, for those of you who have been ordained in the past in the Presbyterian Church, if you wish to come forward to lay hands there, maybe you'll go down there and face forward, and then people can come behind you and lay hands on you or lay hands on the person in front of you, <laughs> in front of them. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of ministry and those you have called. We thank you for Sarah and for her return to service as a deacon. We pray that you would strengthen her and empower her for the work that you have put before her. Give her strength and compassion and vision. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Sarah, you are now once again a deacon in the church and for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And now Joy, don't go anywhere. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Joy, one of your fellow deacons will give you a charge, and then everybody will give hugs and handshakes and say welcome. Sarah, hear these words from Colossians 3, 12 through 14 as you charge into ministry. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what ever else you put on wear love it's your basic all-purpose garment never be without it you guys clapped last week so yeah remind you that following worship today there's a time of fellowship downstairs in our fellowship hall 
our uh, fellowship and membership committee is some offering something new this year. Usually on the last Sunday of the month, they are providing birthday cake to celebrate the birthdays of everyone who uh, turned another year uh, in that given month. Uh, they're doing it a week early this week, and so if you're a January birthday, please come down so that we can celebrate you. If you're not a January birthday, please come down so that you can celebrate the January birthdays. And the reason that we are doing it this week is because I want to tell you about what's happening in coffee hour next week, which is that we're having a reception for John and Anna Babe. John concludes his ministry among us for this period of time. See how I did that? Um, <laughs> next Sunday. And so we're going to have a special time of uh, honoring him. If you want to bring cards and say a few words, we'll be doing that next week during coffee hour. I want to br bring your attention to that. And then we have a congregational meeting on February the 5th. Um, that's our annual meeting, so we'll be looking back at 2022 and receiving our annual report. We're also going to be voting on the pastor's terms of call, again, because we needed to clarify something, so I want to alert you to that meeting on February the 5th. I'd like to invite the kids who are here to come forward this morning. I have one of my kids' favorite books from when they were little. It's called Jungle Drums and it's by Graham Bass. Do you know this book? No. no? Well, I'm going to read part of it. It's kind of a long book, so I'm also going to summarize it. So, Will, you know, good luck. <laughs> so, this guy right here, his name is Nigiri Madogo, and he's a warthog. Small, isn't he? He's the smallest warthog in Africa. They're, these are the bigger warthogs, and they tease Nagiri about being so small, but that's only because they're jealous of the other animals who live across the river with their stunning spots and striking stripes, impressive horns and curly trunks, graceful necks, and gorgeous plumage. Ah, here are the other animals who live across the river. Aren't they just gorgeous? Every year, the other animals hold a grand parade with prizes for the most beautiful. The warthogs don't even bother entering because mud wrestling is not on the program. Tired of being teased for being small, Nagiri heads across the river to play with the other animals. They are arguing among themselves who is the most beautiful. They turn and they stare at Nagiri. No spots, laughs Chui the leopard. No stripes, whinnies Pundamelia the zebra. Look at those silly little horns, snorts Kifaru the rhino. He hasn't even got a trunk, trumpets Tembo the elephant. Or a neck, scoffs Twiga the giraffe. Isn't he just the ugliest thing you've ever seen, crows Nigege the cr crested crane. And small, too. And they laugh out loud. How do you think that makes Nagiri feel? Not good. Nagiri heads for home and he is not happy. And on the way, he meets old Niyumbu, the wildebeest, the oldest and wisest animal in the jungle. I hate being so small, he tells her. Everyone teases me. Old Niyumbu gets out a little set of bongos. These are magic bongos, she says. If you play them, they will give you whatever you wish for. Do you want them? Oh, yes, cries Nagiri. I do. He takes the drums in eager hooves. Old Niyumbu has a twinkle in her eye. Just remember, she says, wishes can come true, but not always as you expect. And she gently fades into the bushes. The sound of jungle drums throbs through the night. Are you ready? Oh, gosh. But in the morning, what has happened? The other animals that were so beautiful, they've lost their stunning spots and striking stripes, their impressive horns and curly trunks, graceful necks and gorgeous plumage. And are they happy? No, no they're very upset. And the warthogs have woken up, and how do they look? They look like the other animals. So we have zebra stripes and crested crane looks and leopard spots and, 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 and uh, what's this, draft spots and leopard spots. 
it's all mixed up. When the other animals hear on the grapevine that the warthogs are going to enter the grand parade now because they're so fancy, they're horrified. Look at us, they say in dismay. Those awful warthogs will win every prize. It will be a total disaster. And so what they try doing is making fake marks with uh, leaves and with berries. Yeah, but then it rains, and it all washes off, and they're back to being plain again. Now, meanwhile, the warthogs parade along, and they think they're very fancy, and they get in an argument with the other animals, and it's going very poorly for Nigiri. What has he done? And so the wild African moon comes up, and jungle drums beat out across the savanna another time. Guess what happens? Well, you might think so, but now you have to pay attention. I think Mr. Graham Bass is a really good artist because now everybody's mixed up in shapes and colors and the other animals are angry. They have put a spell on us and they stomp off angrily across the river. But meanwhile, what happened to the warthogs? They're all mixed too. They have mixed stripage. The, here's a warthog with a really long elephant nose and they're angry and they stomp off to the river. What have you done to us, demand the warthogs. What have you done to us, demand the other animals. Everyone is shouting at once. Stop it, cries Nagiri in a squeaky voice. It was me. All the animals stop and look at him in amazement. And he tells them about the magic drums. I made a wish, two wishes, in fact, though they went wrong. I wanted you to all stop teasing me, but I didn't mean for you to start fighting. Why can't you all be happy the way you are? Because we look ridiculous, says everyone together. We want to be the way we were. Well, says Nagiri thoughtfully, if you'd all be happier that way, I suppose I could try making one more wish. And so he beat the drums again during the night. And as the sun rises over the rim of the world, the warthogs and the other animals wake and look around with relief. They're all back to normal. But Nagiri Madogo sighs. After all that trouble, he's still exactly the same. He's the smallest warthog in Africa. But something has changed, though. No one is teasing him anymore. The bigger warthogs and the other animals look at Nigira, Nigiri and that at each other, and they shrug. So what if he's the littlest? Somebody has to be. And so that night they have the grand parade, and the other animals, with all their fanciness, their long trunks and graceful necks and gorgeous plumage, and guess what? The warthogs have mud wrestling, and they make a mud fountain, and everyone claps and cheers. And then Nagiri does a drum solo, but is very careful not to wish for anything in case. And everyone claps and cheers, and the night is a roaring success. The end. Now here's my question. Graham Bass wrote this book, and he illustrated this book. What do you think he wants you to take away from this book? You shouldn't tease people for how they look. I like that. Any other lessons? Do you remember in the beginning, the other animals were very, very full of themselves because they had so much color and compared to the warthogs, they, 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 they thought they were better, didn't they? They were very full of themselves. Do you think Graham Bates has a thought about whether they should have been full of themselves? Yeah, not be full of yourself and accept people or animals for who they are, right? And maybe not split into different groups, right? I mean, there were the other animals, but what if the elephants then split off from the other animals and the crested cranes all split off? and the giraffes all split off, right? And then it would just be everybody split off by themselves. I think he's also trying to talk about how we can cooperate and, and work together, too, and not separate. Yeah. 
I think that's a good message for all people, and especially in the church. So can we pray together? Awesome. Thanks, Denver. God, we want to say thank you for creating us. Thank you for the individuality that you've given to us, our God-given differences. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us to work together with one another in unity. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thanks, Ember. You can grab your um, worship notebook if you want and return to your seat. Good morning. Please pray with me. Lord, we come before you with open minds, wishing to live in harmony. Be with Pastor Stephanie as she preaches and help us be receptive and understanding of her message. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture I'm reading today is Psalms 133, and it's one of the shorter psalms. And there is one verse in there that's repeated, and Stephanie said that's because it's for emphasis. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes, It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. This ends the reading of the Old Testament. Thanks be to God. Last week we started with the opening greeting and thanksgiving from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And if you recall, the theme of those first nine verses was call. Paul was called to be an apostle. The Corinthians were called to be saints, to be set apart. They were able to call on the name of the Lord, and they were called to work in partnership with Jesus. And I mentioned that it was Paul's practice To mention his call as an apostle, the word apostolos in Greek, as one sent in authority when he's about to do some teaching or correction. He, He wants to lead and say, I have the authority to offer this feedback to you. And we didn't dive into all the the details about Corinth this last week, so I want to give you some of them this week. Uh, Corinth had a reputation. And part of that reputation came as a result of its geographical location. It sits on the isthmus between the Peloponnesian Peninsula and the rest of Greece. And shippers or merchants wanted to avoid the storms of the open Mediterranean, and so they would come into that isthmus and carry overland their cargo and then enter into the main Mediterranean. It became a commercial hub because of the variety of the merchants that passed through. It was known for artisanal, I don't know how to say that word, fancy goods uh, in bronze and earthenware pottery. It was also a religious hub. The sailors who passed through the community brought whatever religion uh, with them from their homes. And modern archaeologists have found evidence of more than two dozen different kind of temples or altars or shrines in ancient Corinth, not to mention Jewish synagogues and Christian house churches. At the time that Paul wrote, Corinth had colony status from Rome, and Latin would have been the governmental language, but Greek would have been what the people spoke. And the city was known for hosting the Isthmian. You know, if you're an Isthmus, then you have the Isthmian Games, a sort of uh, Olympics, if you will, that were held every two years. But other than that, it was considered to be a town that didn't have very much cultural charm. The people of the day were described as having a generally superficial cultural life, They were said to be without grace and charm and not the least convivial. Some 40 years before Jesus' day, the emperor Julius Caesar moved thousands of upwardly mobile 
free persons from Rome to Corinth to offload their impact on the city of Rome. And so this created a citizenry of Corinth that had a lot of wealth, but not much collective culture that they shared together. It was a community that also had those living at different ends of the economic spectrum. There were those who were quite wealthy, and there were slaves and people who were poor. And Corinth was a melting pot. And to follow that metaphor a little bit further, they were a boiling cauldron of potential conflict. If you know anything about Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, you know that he writes to them to address conflicts among them. The divide between the haves and the have-nots translated into great difficulties for the community as a whole, but it also seeped into the Corinthian church as well. First Clement is the name of a document written from the church in Rome a full generation after Paul's day says this about the Corinthian Christians. It said that they were continuing to engage in partisan strife. They were breaking off into factions and having arguments. And it was to the church in this specific cultural context that Paul is writing. And he's written to them before. We know that because he references in this letter a letter that he had already written to them. So if you want to be really technically correct, 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is 3 Corinthians. But don't go on to Jeopardy with that. You'll get it wrong. That's probably enough of an introduction. So let's listen to what Paul says to this conflicted church. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians again, verses 10 through 18. Paul says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and, by this, and for the same purpose. For it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people, so he's getting a report, right, that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. And what I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one could say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. You can almost hear him saying, I wish I hadn't brought that up. And now, <laughs> on to the point. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul doesn't beat around the bush. Hi, guys. I'm writing to you because I heard that you have breaking up into various factions and divisions, and that's not what being a follower of Jesus is all about. Here's a short list of some of the conflicts and the dissension plaguing the church in Corinth that Paul will tackle later in this letter. They're arguing about baptism. They're arguing about misplaced loyalty to gospel teachers. They're arguing about sexual immorality, meat sacrifice to idols, inappropriate behavior at the communion table, the role of women in the church, and the exploitation of the poor by the rich. Every once in a while, some well-meaning church person will say to me, sort of as a lament and a longing. I just don't like how church politics are happening now. If only we could go back to the first century church. 
They were arguing about baptism, misplaced loyalty to gospel teachers, sexual immorality, meat sacrifice to idols, inappropriate behavior at the communion table, the role of women at the church, and the exploitation of the poor by the rich. Was it that much better then? Was it less conflicted then? Have they read 1 Corinthians? Because when I see the church today and compare it to the church of Corinth, I see a lot of similarities. The first century church wasn't any purer or nicer than what we see today. So Paul's letter to the church in Corinth can be understood not only as a letter for the first century, but also a letter for the 21st century as well. And here in chapter 1, Paul tackles the first division that he's heard about that's plaguing the church. People are aligning themselves around key personalities and their teaching. And you can almost hear him mimicking their bragging tone. I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Me, I follow Cephas. And he puts the kibosh on that kind of thinking. He says, Christ isn't divided. It's not about following these key personalities. It's about following Christ. And friends, this is a place where it would be really easy for us to point a finger at someone else. It would be easy for us to, to look around this room or around our larger community or our nation and say things like, they're way too into Richard Rohr, or Joel Osteen, or John Pavlovitz, or Rob Bell, or Sarah Bessie, Rachel Held Evans, or Kate Bowler, or the evangelical F agenda. They have greater allegiance to the conservative agenda, or the liberal agenda. They've given up on the, the gospel and they spend all their time on social justice. Or we can pick on denominations. We like to do that sometimes. Too exuberant. Too boring. And Paul is going to take the next four chapters of this letter to dig into this concern about factions and dissension and quarrels. But right now, we get the big picture here at the beginning the rhetorical questions of verse 13 imply his criticism of any devotion to a Christian leader or a Christian teaching that compromises the central identification of the believer with Jesus Christ. The answer to Paul's question, has Christ been divided? is obviously no, but the behavior of the Corinthians suggests that they believe Christ may be indeed divided into special interest groups. The seemingly absurd questions, was, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Point out the equal absurdity of identifying oneself with a, a Christian leader or teaching rather than with Christ. And maybe it's really easy. You think, I don't do that. Do you have an opinion about the directors of music, worship, and arts that have served this congregation? Do you have a favorite? Do you talk about that in your small group and allow it to affect your worship or your presence here? Maybe the finger points inward, too. It's a great passage to be considering as we're looking at that transition, as we say goodbye to John and hopefully one day welcome somebody new. Who do you follow? You follow Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. Paul's call and reminder to the Corinthians is the same as it is for Anacortesians <laughs> today. It's a call to unity in Christ. It's a call to recognize and to place oneself in a position of obedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul's call to give up dissensions and quarrels isn't 
isn't really a threat to our diversity. He embraces diversity. There are places in this letter where he will urge for a plurality of understanding, like when he's talking about meat being sacrificed to idols. He says, you could go either way. Or when he's talking about spiritual gifts, some people have this, some others here. Paul's not calling the church to uniformity. He's calling us to unity. And whether you attribute the thought to Augustine, some people say it goes back that far, others will stick with John Wesley, the, the saying that maybe you're familiar with, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. I think it goes back even further than Augustine. I think we're hearing Paul say it here. And for all the quarrels and the dissensions that he will address in this letter, he will return to the same argument that there is only one Christ, one Jesus. And even though there are different teachers and preachers and music team leaders and beliefs about communion and women and leadership and which gender is the head of the household and what that even means, even though there are different denominations, the fact remains there's only one Christ. We may be tempted to claim our little special stake of real estate. But Paul says no. One Christ, one church, unity. I don't know if you've ever been to the ecumenical Good Friday service that we hold here in Anacortes. That is an incredible testament to unity. Do you know how easy it would be for Father Mel at St. Mary's to say, no, I follow Rome. We won't be participating. Or one of the more conservative churches, could you imagine them saying, we follow our bylaws and they say no women in leadership and so if she's participating, we are not. Or I could say, I follow the Book of Common Worship and if the presider at the communion table isn't going to say the words of institution in a way that I recognize, I'm not participating. As we plan for that service every year, I can assure you that the clergy who are present and who are participating are constantly bringing to the forefront of their mind Paul's teaching here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. No division, no quarrels, unity. The cross and the saving death of Christ pulling us together. Christ undivided. So friends, this is my, this is my plea. This is Paul's plea. Pay attention to what, to who influences your faith life. What or who are you following? Where are you getting the information that guides your faith development? It's easy for us to, to look back and scoff at the Corinthians for the way that they're coming apart at the seams, but Paul is calling us to examine ourselves in a similar manner. Is there a cause or a personality that you are allowing to direct your faith with more influence than Jesus himself? Is there a cause or a personality that you're allowing to direct your faith with more influence than Jesus himself? Paul makes his appeal in the name of the one who should be uniting us. He says, I appeal to you, sisters and brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. And friends, that takes an exceptional amount of work and effort. Let's pray and ask God to help us with that. Almighty God, you know how easy it is for us to look across the river and see others 
who are different. And how easy it is for us to break off into factions, to have quarrels and dissension. And because it's so easy, it just becomes normal. But it is not the ideal to which you have called us. And so, God, we repent. We repent and we realign ourselves with you. We place our lives in obedience to your word, to your word speaking to us. That is our highest allegiance. Help us to live that out. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As we get ready to pray for uh, the people of our church, the world that we live in, our community, I I would ask you to remember Jim Sykema and Mary in your prayers. Uh, Jim was in the hospital this week. He went home, I think, on Friday. Um, He's receiving hospice care. His cancer has metastasized. And so just prayers for them and for their daughter, Anna. Also want to pray for Bill Wagner and his extended family. His father passed away yesterday morning. And so want to keep them in our prayers. How else would you care to pray this morning? Please, Nick. For the people of Ukraine, and may I add, for an end to the war there? Yes. Others. Please, Jean. Prayers for Jean's friend Sharon facing cancer treatment. Did you say for the third time? Yeah. I would ask prayers for our search for uh, our next director of music, work, worship, and arts. Right now, um, we've not seen any of that come to completion, o- o- even though we've been looking for the last four months. And so there's a little bit of unknown and anxiety there. And so just ask for your prayers. Um, and to share that we are looking for either a part-time or a full-time person. Heather. I'm sorry, I did not hear you. The people in California, in you said the name of it, and I'm sorry. Monterey Park, thank you. And I saw another hand. Kay, please. For Ken and Carolyn Bruner. Carolyn is in a care center up in Bellingham, and he's making the trip and trying to manage a lot there. Anyone else? John, please. for the people of Russia and for, I, I guess I, I would add on that, uh, the leaders in, in nations to make, make good godly decisions. Let's pray. God, we come before you and we lift up those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. We ask you to bring your comforting presence to Jim, to the people of Monterey Park in California, to Sharon. We ask that you would bring your shalom peace to the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia, the people of every nation of this beautiful world that you have created. May we see ourselves as brothers and sisters. May we find the ability to get along. 
We pray for Ken and Carolyn and for all who experience separation because of illness. We pray, God, that your spirit would enable us to feel connected to you, to your call on our lives. We pray, God, with thanksgiving for the gift of your church and its many different expressions. We pray for our brother and sister churches throughout this community. Lift up those churches who, like us, are looking for music leaders or pastors. Be a part of our search. Help us all to find the right people. Lord God, may we serve this community that your light would shine out from us. We pray with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship where we um, give offerings to God. And I wanted to share just a couple things. Did you know that the WPC, Mission and Evangelism Committee, supports local mission? And some of the local missions we support are the Anacortes Boys and Girls Club, Anacortes Family Center, New Earth Recovery, Anacortes Chapter of Salvation Army, Food to Go, Dinner at the Brick, Quaker Cove. And did you know regionally that we support the missionary couple Danielle and Kevin Riley at Mount Baker Presbyterian Church in Concrete. And now nationally, we are um, par partnering with Mountain View Presbyterian Church in Marysville as they contribute to a health clinic in Senegal. Your tithes and offerings help keep the lights, the lights on in this building. They pay the salary of all the staff and they help spread the good news of Jesus Christ through uniting us in one body. Please give as you are able, online or at the back of the sanctuary. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your generous blessings on each of us. We ask that the gifts given will be received and used to glorify your holy name. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand up. You know, leaving this position is not an easy thing for me to do. Um, it's, I'm not like, yeah. I'll, we'll ta I'll say more things um, next Sunday, but, um, <laughs> you know, hearing that sermon and thinking about everything Steph just said and said so well, I just, um, yeah, it, I have a lot of thoughts, so. Next Sunday, I hope you can come. We're, you know, obviously we're looking forward to our reception. It's also sad. It's, 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 there's, there's a sadness to it. So um, let's sing this next song, Not Sad, um, <laughs> with a little bit of joy. But, um, yeah, I want to I wanna find the joy even though I'm feeling a little sad. So.
this is all. And this is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And or is celebrating a birthday in January? Jeannie Parrott, Debbie, Deb, I hope other people, I, I hope you'll go downstairs and let us celebrate you. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.